Welcome everybody to What's Up Fandom. My name is Josh and today I have a very special guest. I have the CCO of Atomic Cartoons. That stands for Chief Creative Officer for those people that don't know acronyms. Um, and he's also the executive producer for The Last Kids on Earth and Hello Ninja. We have Matt Berkowitz. How's it going, Matt? Hey, doing great. How are you today? Not bad at all. Um, so, Matt, thank, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. It's a privilege to be here. Now, question. Did I say Atomic Comics in the thing, or did I actually say Atomic Cartoons? Did I say it oh, correctly or did it. I say it incorrectly? Good. <laughs> okay. Because I... Because like I come from Oklahoma, and we had a, a little comic book store called Atomic Comics, and I've written in my notes Atomic Comics. I I looked on here three times now, so I will probably say Atomic Comics. Don't get offended. Um, it's in fact it's incentive for you guys to have a comic line, if there anything. So there you maybe go. I'll be saying it by the end of this. As there well. you go, and, and then you know your CCO. Who knows? Maybe you change the name. uh but no so matt um if you wouldn't mind um just kind of tell us uh, a little bit about yourself yeah absolutely um uh so i uh i grew up watching cartoons and i just never stopped um so i um, I feel that i feel that that's in my soul there we go all the way and it's funny like i was a nicktoons kid growing up um i remember very much like doug and ren and stimpy and rugrats all hitting at once and then just being like, oh my goodness, what is this? Um, and then it took me years because for a few years that I would like only watch a Nicktoon. And then I finally like opened up and it was like, oh, there's a lot of other great animation out there too. So I should embrace and enjoy this. But there were a couple years where if it wasn't, if it wasn't a Nicktoon, I didn't, I didn't even look. Um, oh and- yeah, dude, I, I completely understand. Cause I mean, like it was Nicktoons for the longest time. Oh, yeah. And then like Cartoon Network was like, you know what, we can do this too. And then Cartoon Network comes over and then Disney starts doing stuff. So like, I kind of like migrated over from Nick into like that Cartoon Network land. And then totally. you know, migrate a little bit back over to Nick sometimes, depending on what was going on. Yeah. Oh, all the way. Same boat, same boat. And I feel like when Hey Arnold came out for me was one where like, I guess most other kids my age, we're, we're going to start moving into like, we're going to watch more live action. And I was like, nope. And I think, hey, Arnold is not to age myself, but that was the one where I just kind of kept going yeah. um, uh, with cartoons. And yeah, so I, uh, I grew up loving cartoons. I grew up a big uh, TV and movie fan um, and just entertainment fan in general. And um, so uh, I, went, I went to school for it and um, I was really fortunate. Um, I never, I, uh, I went to school in upstate New York uh, at Syracuse and I always kept going back to like, if I, I want to be focused in entertainment, but I'd really love to be in animation, but I can't draw. Like even my stick figures are crooked. Like I am just terrible at it. And so I was really fortunate um, to get an internship before I graduated at uh, Cartoon Network. And so I came out to LA and I first off, like I'd never been to California. And I was like, this place is cool. This is a fun place to spend a summer. Um, but then on top of that, um, in really digging in, I realized like, hey, even though I can't draw, um, coming in from like the writing side of it um, was uh, was where my mindset was, um, was just really thinking of it from that perspective. Um, that then uh, got me into development and the producing side of it. And so I feel really grateful that, um, you know, and I learned, uh, and for everybody else out there, like there's definitely opportunities in animation if you can't draw um, and uh, lots of ways to support the process and be a part of it and still be creative um, and team up with lots of talented artists. So I am uh, I always just think of myself as like uh, the biggest uh, 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 fanboy, so to speak, of, of the bunch. And I spend a lot of my time just geeking out and working with creators and talent that I'm just a huge fan of and want to help set an environment that we can all do our best. That's awesome. That's that's perfect. That's like the dream goal. Like that that was like when we first started like Animation Station podcast and then What's Up Fandom, that was the goal. It was like, we just want to kind of like nerd out. And because I mean, we would do that at IHOP at like two in the morning. So <laughs> like you go see, a, like we worked at a movie theater. So uh, we would, you know, the movies would end. We would have to close everything up. And then the only thing that was open was like, I hop at 2 a.m. So we would go to I hop and we would chat for like an hour, two hours, and then we would go home. So yeah, like uh, that's exactly what we used to do. And I remember um, back then I was like, man, they should make a TV show about this. Just like <laughs> us, just like chatting about random 
you know, like TVs and movies and stuff like that. And that's kind of where the podcast happened. Um, that's amazing. So, so with the animation, like, so you went to school. Uh, did you go to school uh, f- like thinking that I'm going to be in the animation business or? I went in thinking I'd love to be in animation. I would just love to be in entertainment and involved in storytelling. And so when I quickly realized like in school, um, like you get to make your own like films and whatnot, I was just always so into the storytelling side of it on the front end. Mm -hmm. Um, Like really fun to get on set and like work with the camera and all of that. Um, But uh, I definitely realized like, A, there were many people well more talented talented than me as a a director. Um, But then also like, I really got my kicks um, just being a part of the team um, and iterating on the story process and really the, the like, the collaborative culture around like, how do we tell a good character story um, and all the layers that you build in because ultimately like you can make as cool a world as you'd like, but it's not gonna be compelling at all if there aren't you know amazing characters at the center of it. Yeah. And so I realized very quickly, both in school and after like that this was a part that I just really loved. Um, and I felt like it was a great opportunity to help mold things and kind of think about the writing as the foundation. And then we build and build uh, across that every every step like I think a big part of animation is like there are such huge teams that work on these projects and if you're doing an animated show or movie right um, you know you're doing it right when you're like we worked that story as much as we possibly could at script and we feel great about it and now we're going to get into storyboard and like it's tight enough and you know enough about these characters and where they're coming from that in storyboard an, a board artist isn't having to solve story problems that remained from script, but they're instead like, wow, this is a great foundation. And now that I'm seeing this, oh, we can plus the scene this way. And what if we add this? And what if we play with this? Um, And then you're leveling up. And then same deal when you have awesome tight locked boards and an animatic and you feel really good about that and you get into actual animation shot production, you want those animators thinking the same thing. Like, okay, I fully follow everything. And because we already have such clear detail and such a perspective on these characters, I can push the limits a little bit. And so every step of the way, you wanna see it come back um, stronger and with a new ingredient that you didn't have at the stage before. And you can tell sometimes on an animated show where like cool storytelling, cool animatic, and then, oh, we we didn't quite pull it off in animation um, or whatever it may be. You always, I think for us, we look at like the sign of a successful show is every step as more talented folks get involved, it takes it that step further, right all the way through like music and score and final mix. Um, That's that's always kind of what we're after. And And, I mean, it shows because it helps you guys win an Emmy. Uh, so. That was a fun one. We didn't we didn't quite expect that. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it was a first one for all of us, and um, you know, uh, it, there were incredible shows that we were up against in that category, um, and we were really proud of. You know, we we always felt from the beginning, Max, uh, the creator of Last Kids on Earth, um, he wrote an, uh, an incredible book series, and we felt that there was so much comedy and so much heart to it. And like on its surface, like big picture, 30,000 foot point of view, you're like, all right, kids are battling monsters and zombies. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, And then you get into it and you're like, you get the core group of kids and you're like, oh, this is really neat. And there's like a little bit of that babysitter's club angle to Mm -hmm. it. Um, uh, But then, um, or sorry, not babysitter's club, breakfast club. Um, but then, well, kind of a little bit of babysitter's club too. Like if, if we gotta, if we want to like dig deep down into it, yeah, you definitely get some of that. But then, like even underneath all of it, like um, we always try to think about stories as like, like I love my popcorn movies, I love my blockbusters. Um, uh, but then, like the the balance of like something that is really fun and accessible for many folks, and just a blast of entertainment. And then finding that heart within it. And I really felt like when we, when we read Last Kids and we saw that ultimately it's this huge action adventure spectacle, but it's centered around a foster kid who finds a, a family in his friends in the end of the world. And that was some real heart behind it. And yeah. they're not just surviving, they're thriving. And Max did such a wonderful job in writing those books. Um, and we really felt he also had like in reading it, we always felt like we were reading like something a little Edgar, Edgar Wright style. 
Um, and so we were like, man, if we could make a show about this, it'd be really fun to try to uh, do our best take at, uh, at, at uh, Edgar Wright. Um, and so, you know, I think we always felt that the storytelling um, had the opportunity to break through and hopefully connect on that level. Um, but I can't lie, we, we never dreamed of like, hey, one day there's gonna be an Emmy nomination or a win or things like that. So it was really fun when it happened. Uh, we all, uh, as we do, we geeked out pretty hard and uh, yeah, it was, it was fun to see come together. But ultimately we're just trying to tell some good stories and, and hope uh, kids and their families resonate with it. Nice. And, and we'll talk about uh, Last Kids on Earth uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit further down. Um, but I want to ask some, some pretty important questions here. Um, I feel like we're, we're very close to the same age, you mm -hmm. and I. Um, so let's, let's just go into it. Like, let's, let's like break, let's, let's sit down, um, do the heavy hitting journalism and uh, like, what's your favorite like cartoons and movies like growing up? Like now, now I want to know. Oh yeah. <laughs> so back to the Nicktoons thing. Doug ninety one to ninety five Nickelodeon eleven. Oh, not episode. Disney Doug. Yeah. When everything got weird and, <laughs> and Patty got a haircut. Oh yeah. I and Doug and Doug got long long. Yeah, he got his it somehow somehow his his entire wardrobe was basically the same. But then he was like how about three quarter length sleeves? And they're like, done. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I was, I was pretty hardcore on Doug 91 to 95. I'd say that might be one of like the most like seminal TV shows uh, for me. And like to this day, I will still go back and watch it. Or um, I got to meet uh, the, the guy who wrote Killer Tofu and like, oh. I'm sorry, but I spent like the bulk of the meeting just wanting to talk about that. Cause I was so blown away. I almost wanted to like sing it together. Um, and um uh, and then on the movie side, oh gosh, there's a lot. I'd say, um, you know, I was a big Disney movie kid. Um, I'd say, uh, you know, Lion King and Aladdin, and then not an animated movie, but obviously a lot of animation in there. Jurassic Park. Um, we're we're like, you and I are like connected. Like, <laughs> you're, you're hitting everything. Uh, what's great is because like, because now What's Up Fandom, we can do everything now so we can talk about these live action movies. Whereas an animation station, it was like, no, I don't talk about anything that's not animation. <laughs> um, so yeah, dude, like my favorite, well, for growing up, definitely my favorite Disney was Lion King. I think Zootopia has kind of like pushed it out since then just because awesome. I think it's a little bit stronger. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic movie. And, but yeah, Jurassic Park, like, phenomenal movie still holds up oh yeah um, how about on the tv movie, side for you oh yeah like another another movie for sorry real quick another movie that again i still think holds up that i don't think anybody watches anymore um starship troopers still maybe the perfect movie i mean if we if we sit down and look at it it's the perfect movie oh it's pretty great <laughs> it's pretty great i uh, i definitely i'm with you i think we have some some shared uh a strong bond here because I think that's a movie I've probably seen more than ten times. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, uh, what about what about TV? Um, uh, TV just in general or yeah. uh, or growing up or um, well, I have a little to... bit of both. Why not? Uh, we got okay. See, I'm I'm free the rest of the day. There we go. Well, I'll say in the in the last year, um, and I watched the the first episode uh, right after New York Comic Con when it came out, but then and loved it, and then as as life happens, like just a few months went by and then we watched the rest was the, the new Watchmen series. Yes. Um, blew my mind. Just absolutely like, I, I have spent so many hours of conversation since then, just chatting with folks about it and wanting to know like, how did they beautiful mind that storytelling? Because the way that they weaved all of this together in such an incredible format and like, I obviously was a big fan of the graphic novel. I enjoyed the movie. It wasn't my favorite movie, but I did enjoy it. Yeah, and I felt like this series um, just was so incredible on the many layered levels of storytelling within it. And I look at that and I'm like, well, I don't think I could ever pull off something on that level, but I just want to adore it over and over. So that's a, that's a recent one for me on that side of it. Um, uh, on that on that end um and then as far as some recent animation that uh that were uh enjoying dragon prince like i can't lie that show has been spectacular to watch 
um, and to see evolve. And I think is really, uh, I think that that team is really pushing the boundaries, both in storytelling and in visual style. And I'm excited to see where they take it from here. Yeah, same. Um, yeah, I, going back to Watchmen, my goodness, it was so good when the finale happened. We actually did an Animation Station podcast episode on Watchmen, and we <laughs> prefaced it with like, "There's animation; people get blue." There like, you go. There Very you go. True. Was, technically, we can get away with it. Um, I, I agree. So yeah, like yeah, <laughs> it's it was such a good. I mean, and uh, like this is it's it's one of those things that growing up in Oklahoma, um, the, the, everything that happened in Tulsa is like not taught in schools. Same. Like no idea. I was 30 years old when I found out about the Tulsa race, right? And I was like, what now? There was, how come nobody told me? I took Oklahoma history. Like I took that for a whole year and nothing. And it's just like, wow, it is incredible. Like I was, and then going and doing all the reading and research and you're like oh my gosh it was it was tough it was like i it made me not proud to be an oklahoman which they're all about being proud to be an oklahoman even there's a broadway musical <laughs> there you got go. our state song <laughs> you know totally but i have to say it's fascinating because same boat um and i you know while i while i majored in like tv and film in college my minor was u.s history like it was until I watched that episode, I did not know about it. And then I turned to my wife and I was like, did this really happen? And then I was like Googling while we were watching. And I was like, how do we not know about this? Yeah. Um, like it is. And then I, I'm sure you did the same asking a lot of folks, did you know about this event? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a shame that it isn't uh, uh, taught in class because I do think that's something like for all the textbooks we all read growing up, that was not there. Yeah. Like I went to, like, I didn't learn about it in, I, I think my problem may have been like, I went to a private school, mm -hmm. but at the same time, like I also went to a university and didn't learn it there either. And I did world history. So you did yeah. American history and I was world history. Um, and then I, I was world history and like religions of the world, two mm -hmm. vastly things that were also kind of connected. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like didn't learn about it there. Uh, my, one of my best friends, he didn't find out until he went to OU. Um, like, cause didn't know anything about it in high school, found out, at at a university and was like oh snap so he knew about it but it wasn't like the same time that like i think he learned it his senior year so it's one of those like why aren't we learning about this like in that seventh grade area when we're supposed to be learning about this yeah. and it's and it is a really important thing to learn i mean look at everything going on in the world right now like it's so relevant um, and it really does speak to, you see, you know, you see history repeating itself. That's a, obviously a pattern forever now. Um, and yeah, it kind of blows my mind. Yeah. It's, uh... All right. Atomic cartoons. <laughs> uh, so, um, so we're going to talk about atomic cartoons. Um, I, I noticed I said it correctly. Uh, so it's an animation studio. Um, been around 21 years, right? Um, congratulations, your studio can drink. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what the legal age in Canada is. So maybe it was already drinking. I have no clue. Um, <laughs> but like uh, based in Vancouver and you also have studios in Ottawa and LA. Yeah. Um, are you, are you in LA or are you Vancouver? Uh, I'm in LA. Yeah. LA. Okay. Um, maybe one day we'll meet each other. There we go. The After all this ends. Back together. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, Atomic uh, Cartoons, almost, I taught myself. Um, they worked on all kinds of stuff, like Courage the Cowardly Dog, which I remember watching growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, Johnny Tess, Max and Ruby, the Lego Jurassic World stuff that's going on. You guys oh, yeah. are also doing a Lego Star Wars holiday special. That's how. Like, <laughs> I thought that was purged from all of the archives. So it's going to be interesting to see what you guys do with that. Totally. Um, you got The Last Kids on Earth, Hello Ninja, and then uh, Hilda, which uh, based on a French comic, I believe. Uh, I don't remember French. if it's it, I don't remember if it's French. It's a but uh, yeah, created by Luke Pearson. I, yeah. I it's bad that I don't know this either on this one. Um, uh, Hilda was. 
<laughs> um, yeah, Hilda was a really unique one and something, um, you know, actually a shout out to another studio. Um, uh, Mercury uh, Filmworks in Ottawa mm -hmm. um, was working on the show and they were really busy at the time and they'd partnered with us on a, on a few different shows and they said, hey, we're doing Hilda. Would the team at Atomic be interested in taking on some of these episodes with us? And I was actually at the studio in Vancouver that day when we rolled it out to the floor and like the audible gasps from artists of like, oh my gosh, we get to adapt that. Um, and it was such a privilege um, uh, to be able to participate and uh, animate some of those episodes. So a big thanks to Mercury who, uh, and Silvergate who put that show together. And uh, it was a privilege to, uh, to team up with them on it. Hi, right. so uh, can you tell us a little bit about Atomic? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the, the key thing about Atomic and the key thing that makes it really, really fun to work here um, is it was founded by artists and like... Sorry, I like how you're bragging about that. Be like, it's fun to work here while Josh is sitting in his studio. <laughs> Be like, oh yeah, how do you like that? Larry? Yeah, it's like, okay, fine. Hey, I'm I guess sitting, I'm sitting in my closet, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think it's a really neat, set up where, um, you know, I've been fortunate to be at a number of companies over the years and, and really grateful to be at some really quality studios and work with great artists. Um, you know, at Atomic, it, it, it flat out was founded by artists when they made their own show and, and really got things rolling. And um, the studio has grown so much since then for many years, it was like do one show at a time and it was a uh, flash animation. And um, the team did amazing work and did a lot of great stuff. And um, over the last eight or nine years, we've really grown from being a more boutique studio of 40 to 50 people to where we're now over 700 and three locations and whatnot. But all of that is to say that like the core values of the company of like, let's make stuff that we're gonna have a great time working on that we'd be really proud of working on. And let's create an amazing artist environment and really set up the team to have their best opportunity to thrive um, and really enjoy their job and it coming out in the, the uh, animation, um, that stayed true. And so it's really neat that while we've been able to scale and now we get to work on like all sorts of amazing big shows and lots of things going through at once, um, it is still a company that uh, is entirely driven by our artists going to love working on this and do we have the capacity? Um, because we can't just keep growing and growing and growing. Um, you always need to make sure when you're coming onto a project, do we have the right team for it? So much of this is casting and finding, do we have the right art director? Do we have the right designers? Not just do we have space in the building because frankly, who cares about a building? And hey, none of us are using our buildings right now. Anyway. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I do like, I, I think it was funny. When I was reading everything, it was like, oh, you opened a brand new LA studio in, in February. How'd that work out? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. We finished our kitchen the week that we all went home. We were like, look at these coffee machines. Hey, that that's, probably that's never the main thing. Again. That that kitchen break room, I've worked at a lot of places and the kitchen break room is usually the most important. Yeah. I mean, especially and first thing in the morning when people get there, they're like, that's where you congregate. Mm -hmm. Like I worked for a big payroll company and their whole goal was, we want you to stay here because if you leave, there's a chance that you could get in an accident, you could be late, anything like that. So they would cater lunch in every day. They had like basically a whole, like they had a campus. It was yeah. huge. Um, they had, uh, they ended up building another building with another full size cafeteria in there. So mm -hmm. like there were there's water, there were soda machines, like anything that you could ever want, they had it for you. And they're like, oh, you, you guys wanna, we, we, want you, we don't want you to be late. So we'll have milk and cereal ready for you when you come in in the morning. So I understand the purpose of a very, uh, a kitchen, very important. So at least you guys were able to finish that. We did get to finish it. We have no idea how we'll use it in the future, but you know, it'll be there for when we get back. 2024 you guys will be able to go back in there those coffee machines obsolete but it doesn't matter they're there hey maybe the coffee that we had left behind on the last day you know we'll see what it's turned into yeah i don't know does coffee like if it's like it, I, I would assume if it's like stored like you know airtight and everything <laughs> i i assume coffee lasts a while i suppose we'll find out yeah your creamer <laughs> though there we go may be bad mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, 
so so you opened up a new studio finished so congrats congrats that you were able to um get your kitchen done before you had to all leave yeah yeah <laughs> uh it, it was a unique time to open a studio and it's and it's funny because you know we it, it went from like when we first opened in in la um i just took a room in the office that our parent company thunderbird had um mm -hmm. and they were like hey we have this little office there's like a spot in the corner there's a door you'll be able to close it you can set up a phone in there and it was like cool um and um you know uh fortunately things like grew quickly and eventually it was one two three and then six and seven and then we set up the studio in LA and the idea was um you know um so much of what we had been doing on the LA side prior to having an actual like production footprint down here was really um finding properties that we'd love to work on and then uh, doing the writing of them down here um, in in California, and then uh, and teaming up with showrunners and uh, some talent down here, and then everybody, all of us, patching into the studio in Vancouver, and then we opened up Ottawa in um, about a year into Last Kids, um, and got things rolling there. So then we were patching into Vancouver and Ottawa, um, and so much of my background, um, as I said earlier, like a coming up from like a, a writing side, um, I was always teaming up with writer-based showrunners. And it's really easy to be remote and come into our office or work from home or whatever it may be and not have a big production footprint and team around you um, and you know, patch in and go and be able to essentially work and be a satellite. Um, and then as things ramped up more and more, and I give a lot of credit to uh, one of our uh, VPs, um, Kristen Cummings, is she came on board and we're always looking as we brought in our team on like the the content side and, and IP development side, let's always get a bunch of different perspectives because really none of these companies are great for one voice. Um, the companies are great from for different perspectives and 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 then finding that shared vision within things. And so Kristen um, uh, knew a lot of great directors that wanted to pitch ideas. And Ultimately, um, unlike like a writer-based showrunner or doing a writer pod in LA, that's something that you can really easily do outside of the main studio. But if you're going to direct and like get your hands on every episode and be able to work through the frames and whatnot, like you kind of need to be at the studio. And um, Vancouver is an incredible place, but on the same note, uh, lots of folks are, are not necessarily open to relocating. And so, um, uh, you know, whether they have families or obligations or whatever it may be. And so um, as Kristen uh, started to bring forward all these like great directors and ideas, it was like, okay, well, if we're going to be able to work with these folks properly, we really should think about how we're going to be able to support them. And we felt that we would need pods of teams down here um, so that they did have like an art director down here that they're working with and some, da and some board artists and editorial and whatnot to augment um, they're kind of being able to have a mini atomic team here that would then patch into uh, into our studios and work collaboratively hand in hand with Vancouver and Ottawa. However, we couldn't do that out of a, out of an office. We needed to be properly set up as like yes. a studio and have like the proper internet connection and technology to actually transmit all this data back and forth in real time. Um, yeah, there's, so, there's only um, so much you can do out of like a closed down Quiznos. I mean, there's, totally. <laughs> there's not a lot. Yeah, yeah, all the way. And so uh, it was really cool. So that was what started our impetus for the uh, LA office. Um, and we can't say what the, what specifically what the shows are right now, but what we can say is, so we technically opened the office in November. Um, we moved into the studio, or we moved, we opened the studio in November in a temporary space that was connected to our old office space in West Hollywood. The Quiznos. And then, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then in February, we moved into that studio space and the first show was in production. And then in March, obviously, we all had to switch to work from home. Um, so there were like, about just shy of like 30 of us in the building uh, in March. And then since then shows that we had been developing and getting ready to go also greenlit. So now um, our head count is, is uh, closing in closer to, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna be about 75 within a couple months. Oh, nice. And that's been a unique challenge to be honest, because on one hand, it's a thrill. We are getting to work with so many incredibly talented, 
uh, folks. Uh, but on the flip side, something, you know, to talk about like atomic culture before, like we're a place that is founded by artists that want to give a great artist experience. And so much of that is by like the culture that we set in the workplace. Um, and so for us, like, it's like, you know, from your day one orientation and talking about what the company is about and then actually being able to see it. Like, there are no politics here. Anybody can speak up. A good idea can come from anywhere. So much of that came from like your hallway chats and like yeah. not just the meet scheduled meetings, but just getting to know one another. And so um, our challenge has been and something that we've spent a lot of time with is, okay, so you're joining Atomic and you've never stepped foot in the building. And there is a decent chance for that a fair bit of your job on the first show that you're going to work on with us, we're all remote. We're sitting in on Zoom like we're doing now, you know? And that um, experience has been something that we've spent a lot of time on trying to say, how can we get as close to you knowing what it is like to be an Atomic employee, especially if you're coming from another studio and you're like, hi, I'm on my desk at home and I'm shutting down on Friday at where, wherever I am. And then on Monday, I'm starting at Atomic in the same exact spot. Um, and so, um, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time trying to just figure whether it's virtual events or even just orientation or folks getting to know one another, um, really trying to make sure that we, we maintain that culture and that artists can feel appreciated even remotely. Nice. Um, and I think that kind of goes into what I was, uh, some questions that I had, like you being, uh, like the CCO, um, so you're in charge of like media marketing, um, the creative direction of atomic comics cartoons. Dang. Hey, it's the first time. All good. Oh, God. Um, it won't be the last. Um, so I was wondering, and, and this is something that I've been wondering for, for quite a bit. Um, how do you guys decide what type of content, uh, you guys want to produce? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, ultimately, um, we're a studio that does pride ourselves on that most of the content that we're doing has a lot of heart behind it. Um, you know, when we're, and, and as a studio, we do two things. We, we have one, the content that we develop and then uh, own and produce throughout. And then we have stuff like when Lego is kind enough to come to us. We've been doing a lot of shows with Lego over the years and they and Lucasfilm came and they were like, hey, we've had some fun animating shows at, at Atomic. You have some incredibly uh, talented people. Um, would you be up for taking on Star Wars? And in that one, they wrote the script. And you then, were like, nah, it's all right. I don't want to do Star Wars. Who <laughs> wants like, to yes, do Star please, Wars? <laughs> uh, and in something like that, they supply the script, but then we team up with them everything onward. So that doesn't necessarily fall through our like original content division because who are we kidding lucasfilm and lego have that yeah company. you're not gonna um, but then you're still getting to work with the same uh a great bunch of artists um so all of that is to say um when we're looking at our original content our sweet spot really is um similar to a last kids or a hello ninja and i can walk through some of the projects like last kids for us was a very blockbustery commercial type thing because it was monsters and zombies and all of that fun. Mm -hmm. But then, like I said, it also was so centered around like this strong coming of age story for, for the kids. Um, and we kind of look at that at, at most all of our shows. I'd say the similarities that you'll see in an atomic show are we want kids to be empowered. Um, we want it to come from their point of view. Um, we also believe that kids are super smart. Um, and that you don't need to talk down to them and like they can handle serialized storytelling and they can handle the nuance of characters and they can handle if your favorite character gets selfish and has an arc that maybe takes you in a spot where you see some of their darker places that they can follow and still understand who that character is. Um, so, so much of what we're trying to put out there is um, messages of kids being empowered kids being able to take on the world and also like we're always coming of age throughout our whole lives um and so really thinking from that kid's perspective there's so much that you're taking in and evolving um as an individual and so we want our content to hopefully be an outlet for that and something that you can relate to and aspire towards and i'd say that's something that's kind of across the dna of the various shows but it comes up in such different ways and we always for us it's important that it's just organic within it, not like, hey, we liked this world or we liked this idea. Now, how can we shoehorn something in behind it? We fundamentally believe it's either in the idea organically from the beginning 
or it's not. So we don't develop and produce a ton of shows. We keep our slate smaller, but we really try to keep it smaller and then give all of our efforts into that. Um, and ultimately then the volume of shows we produce tends to hold up against our competitors, um, but we really have just focused on a few on a few throughout development rather than developing a lot and having them fall off the wayside. Like mm -hmm. really just say, we're gonna put everything behind this because we're as passionate as a creator on it. Um, so yeah, those are some of the core themes that go across it. But yeah, like on Hello Ninja, for instance, um, that sh it was really cool. Like it was a board book um, from a middle reader author um, and he has five kids, uh, Nate Wilson, and he's incredibly talented. And his youngest was like, hey, you don't really write. Uh, I like, I there's no books of yours that I can read yet that are really for, for me yet because she was younger. And um, they, they wrote Hello Ninja together. Um, and like, it's this beautiful 40 word board book, um, but it's really about all of the amazing things that ninjas can do and the amazing things that you can take on in the world. And it was beautifully illustrated by an artist, Forrest Dickinson. And so in doing that show, we got to team up with the creator, Nate and Forrest. And for us, that show is, um, it's a mindfulness show for preschoolers and really like more centered around a social and emotional curriculum. But we're flat out doing like matrix-like camera moves <laughs> and like really trying to treat every 11 minute episode as like a Kung Fu movie. And like he came to us, Nate, and said, I really want that Calvin and Hobbes feel. And we were like, oh, we want to go crouching tiger, hidden dragon, wire work. How do we meld these things together? But then yeah, underlying it, it's, it's a coming of age story about kids really learning how to approach things and, and, and how to um, uh, accomplish uh, and, and get past their goals or, or any challenges that they may face. Um, or even like, um, uh, I think I can say at this stage, uh, you know, we've been developing for a while a show called Princesses Wear Pants um, based on a uh, book by uh, Savannah Guthrie and Alison Oppenheim. And it's a uh, twice over number one New York Times bestseller. And I have, I have three daughters myself. I've got uh, an almost four year old and then 16 month old twins. And um, Allie and Savannah, the authors, they wrote this book because their daughters were going through a big princess phase. And they weren't anti princess, but they were trying to look at princess role models out there. And historically in animation, it's been a lot of um, you know, find Prince in distress yeah. type of, yeah. Yeah, and you know, they were like, that's fine, but there's so much more you can do with it. And they felt that like being a princess is using the platform that you have to make a difference in the world. Um, and uh, you know, it's about what you can accomplish. And like, it's princesses wear pants because like in the first book, like the lead character, uh, it's centered around a ball. There's all of these expectations of how she's supposed to act and whatnot. And then like stuff goes down and she needs to go save the day. And like, yeah, she's got her pants on underneath and she takes that, uh, that gown off and she gets into action. And so I think that the, the books both celebrate, be yourself and be, uh, you know, embrace that pink and sparkly. That's awesome. That's all good. Um, but there's more to it. And don't just look for Prince Charming. Don't just be a damsel in distress, be the change in the world. Um, and so we were really inspired by that when we read it and uh, we're fortunate enough now, uh, I, we can't say who we're making it with, but we can say that the show's in, in, uh, in full production and going. And nice. so all of these are different angles into that same like coming of age, empower kids, um, give them folks they can relate to, give them opportunities they can aspire to, aspire to and like, you know, similar to like you and I talking about cartoons that we grew up loving, you know, we really hope that we can help inspire that next generation. Nice. Um, how does how do how do you guys go from um, like something like Hello Ninja, which you said is forty four page the book, uh, and something like Last Kids on Earth? How do you go and make those into? Because what Hello Ninja is, is it three seasons, right? Uh, three seasons so far, and there's yeah. A how, how do you make three seasons <laughs> from a forty four page book, and then? I mean, yeah, we've got what uh, book six of Last Kids is coming out. Um, mm -hmm. How do you turn that uh, like just that a one three hundred twenty page book into what ten twenty four minute episodes? How does that work? Oh, totally! It's fun. Like that's some of the best part of this is you know, um, it's character first. You know, it, it truly is like who are these characters and what makes them tick. 
So like, hello, Ninja, every page that you moved on, there was a new piece of artwork in and with the Ninja in a different world and what they could accomplish. Um, some of it was like a Ninja at a supermarket. Some of it was a Ninja climbing a mountain. And we were like, whoa, there is wild range page to page. And we started to think about like, what would that episode be that this page is centered around? Um, and then it really blew up and, and blew up from there. And I'd say the way we do it is by working with a lot of really talented folks, you know, on, um, on Ninja, we had Nate, the creator, and Forrest. Um, but then on the, on the, we also were able to bring in Mark Palmer, who's a very experienced showrunner, both in preschool and six to 11. And he, you know, you get this consortium of people together and then they're like, well, we can push it here. And what about if we, you know, hit this angle and like, oh, let's introduce a new character because as we think about the dynamic of these two kids together, here's what each of them is going to bring to the, to the, to the mix, and then that inspires new stories. And as you go throughout the production and you add more writers or even board artists or the director coming back and pitching ideas, it really ends up being, let's understand the core of the show that we're creating. And you almost as a producer wanna think of yourself as like the, uh, like when you're, uh, when you're bowling and there's like the, the bumpers on the side um, like you kind of just want to be the bumpers and give everybody that opportunity to play and push it right up against the edge as far as possible. And just remember like, these are the core tenets of the show. This is what we need to stay true. Will this episode resonate with that? Um, and then with Last Kids, on the other hand, where like where Ninja's more episodic and everything is a standalone 11 minute, Last Kids where we were doing serialized storytelling, we already felt like he had some pretty epic stuff. And like book one, um, is so much of it is Jack, the lead character, on his own, kind of like almost like I am legendish in terms of like not having, uh, you know, other characters around him. And so we were thinking like, okay, our first thought out of the gate was let's do every book as 10 episodes. And then we started to break that and we were like, oh man, Jack's not going to see another kid for five episodes. Like this is going to be a little bit depressing um, and we felt like okay let's have a rethink um, and we said the first book is just a spectacular movie and when you read those books you're pretty much reading them in about an hour and a half to two hours they're very much like one sitting you get right into it and you read 200 pages and it really flies um, and so we were like why don't we just treat it like a movie and do a special to launch the series? That way, Jack's only on his own for about half an hour. And then we reordered some things so he was only on his own for 20 minutes. We made some small changes. And we felt like that would be a great introduction to the world. We're setting up our core cast. We're setting up their key motivations. And we're setting up their first big villain so they have a huge obstacle to overcome, which was Blarg from the first book. But then we also felt like we really wanted to open up the narrative um, once we hit book two, because obviously book one, you get a really fun story of them and this big monster, but then book two onward, you're introducing a whole world of monsters, good monsters, bad monsters, all of that. And so we wanted to really be able to take the time to track each character and their seasonal arcs. So then going in and breaking 10 episodes made a lot of sense. Um, and same deal, you get to work with incredible writers and you get in a room and you're like, here's what we want to accomplish within these 10 episodes. Here's what we know are some of the key things that are uh, milestone markers from the book that we need to, to stay with. But then how can you push it further and what new things can we bring to the table? Because ultimately, if all we're doing is giving you a retelling of the books, what's the point in adding a new thing to the universe? You always yeah. need a new twist that says like, oh, I couldn't have uh, taken this in in book form, I can only take it in in visual form. And you always want it to all complement itself and use your form of media to bring its own flavor to the mix. Nice. Um, so I think I had done a tweet about this. Um, you know, do you, do you hear about the Netflix show Daybreak? Yes. So I think I, I, I had done a tweet about this and was like, it's good to know that they made like a live action version of Last Kids on Earth. Cause like I watched that series because like I had watched the movie, um, uh, the, the Last Kids movie. And then I, I read the book uh, before and I was like, hmm. then I saw this daybreak and I was like, this, this, is, this is very familiar, this thing. And I'm just like sitting there. I'm like, 
did they like i get that netflix is like kind of like in charge of it did they just like pick that like it was just, it was really weird like watching that series i was like this is just it's so it's so close <laughs> like we had that same thought as well when we saw the trailer come out we were like this looks kind of last kids ish um and you know it's different departments in netflix that goes across yeah. all of this stuff so completely different groups developing it but yeah we did check it out and we were like oh there are some touch points of this series that seem in common um, i mean yeah just like the the opening bit where he's like on his own like inner monologuing and talking to the camera like fourth wall breaking it's like Mm. oh yeah and the pop-ups like all yeah. of it was just like oh okay um yeah that that was a surprise to us as well but i will you know tons of credit to netflix they did such a good job of both of those shows finding their audience and really kind of knowing and targeting it and realizing hey these won't necessarily be competition with one another and somebody may like graduate from the last kids world to the to the daybreak world um and uh yeah but yeah well <laughs> um maybe not maybe one show found its audience and won an emmy and the other one was canceled that same year uh <laughs> not gonna name names but you wouldn't be on here if you'd been canceled uh no just kidding <laughs> um so okay so let's kind of uh i don't want to stay with last kids um what like when did you guys like did you guys have like a feeling like when the first like when the movie came out um back what was it, it was september wasn't it mm -hmm. so when the movie came out in september um or when season two came out this year um when did you guys have like that inkling of we just created something special Oh gosh. Um, or have you been like, eh, just the thing you know, like it's, it's, it's funny. I think for us, what we were most excited about was like, again, there's not a single person that was on that show that was not a fan of Max and his, and, and the books. And so every time that we do an adaptation, the creator always works hand in hand with us. Um, like Max and our showrunner, Scott, um, both fundamentally, um, have been a part of every single part of this show. And so um, the, their DNA and their creative DNA is just throughout all of it. Um, and Max goes on book tours. And before we even started, I, I, uh, I was in Vancouver at the time visiting the studio and Max was doing a book tour and he was in Seattle. And um, we asked, hey, can we come join him at one of the schools just to see like how kids interact with him and what do they get excited about from his presentation and whatnot? And it was very clear, like he had a following that knew every detail about everything in the books. And it was awesome. Like it was so much fun to see these kids light up and Max light up and everybody just really enjoyed talking about Last Kids. And so the show comes out in September and we had aligned the show launch to the book launch. And um, Max sent us a video maybe two weeks into the tour where, like I said, we reorganized some things in the in the special that launched the series um, so that Jack would get to some events earlier. And we switched when the Rover beat happens and uh, the beat of them seeing Dirk. Um, and Max was, <laughs> I don't know how, the, how we, I, I, I guess uh, he recorded it on his phone when he knew he's like, oh, this is just gonna be a good response. And he texted it to a few of us on the show where he was talking about the books and some kids started to raise their hands and they were like, Max, you're wrong. This is the way it actually went down. And it was one week after the show came out and there were all these kids who were big fans of the book, but who were then going to Max and like, you have your story wrong because this is how it happens in the TV show. And then the responses that Max was getting about even small details in the show. And we always obviously pay attention to every small detail and hope that people will pick up on it. But we know for the most part, you don't always get that level of engagement. But the questions that started to come in, you could tell were tied into like a lot of repeat viewings and a lot of just like, I had a great time watching it. And so I think for us, that was when we realized, hey, we've connected with an audience here and they're really embracing it. And they're fans that 
you know, you always want to make sure when you're doing an adaptation of something that like people really enjoy, like don't screw it up. You spend so yeah. much of the time, like just don't screw it up. It's already special. Uh, treat it with a lot of great care. And so we felt at that point, like, all right, the core audience really digs this. And for us, that's always been all that matters. Um, like, the fact that we got through on that level, the fact that kids were feeling inspired. Um, and then Max just kept getting these questions over and over. And even now he's doing like virtual tours and virtual events and they're still coming in. Yeah, we're like, he's all right, got that's, a, that's uh, how we feel. We know it's special. He's got a, I mean, by the time this comes out, it's already over. Um, he's got a, what is it? Like a, a zombie run-a-thon thing coming out like this weekend or next weekend, something like that. Yeah. It's, yeah, like, the amount of stuff that he's able to do, I'm just like, good Lord, like, man, it's, it's really cool. Especially cool to see, you know, everything that he's coming out with. Um, speaking of stuff that's coming out with, uh, is there like, what's next for uh, Atomic Cartoons? Like, is like, what's coming up next that you're allowed to share with us? Yeah. Or if you're so, allowed uh, to share anything with us. Who yeah, knows? Absolutely. I didn't ask the question beforehand. <laughs> um, well, I think we can say um, uh, there's still lots more last kids coming. Um, and so, uh, obviously, uh, this- Did you fall, get one of those sweet Dragon Prince deals where they're like, four more seasons? <laughs> we can't talk about, about the way <laughs> it's set up. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's more Last Kids coming uh, actually shortly after this podcast. By the time that this podcast is out, you all should be able to be watching trailers for the upcoming sweet. season. Um, and then we're also thrilled. Uh, we're doing an interactive episode, which has been so cool to work on at the studio. You guys are uh, bandersnatching it? Oh, yeah. We're doing our awesome. best shot. Awesome. We're doing our best shot. And it is so cool because, like, the team at Netflix that works on this with you is, like, so passionate about what they do. And they totally match, like, all of us nerding out at the studio and all the artists. And, like, so when you're doing these kind of episodes, like at script stage, you put it in what's called the branch manager at Netflix, which is a program that you break your sections of the script out into your interactive format, because obviously everything is choice based. And uh, then you're like reading the script and you're like, okay, well, I can do this or I can do this. And then you click and then it takes you to whatever part of the script it would align to. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens at animatic. So then you get your animatic and you load your animatic into the branch manager. So when you're QCing it and seeing, oh, did this flow right? Did this make sense? Did these shots line up? You're doing that within it. And at every stage of production, you put the new piece in. So then we put our animation in and now we're putting our comp and lighting in. And it's so much fun to work on this thing. It's wild. Oh my so, God. That is also upcoming, uh, and that'll be coming out next year, and we're stoked to be doing it. Uh, um, real quick, I, I don't know if you can answer. Is that going to be just like a season, like an individual episode, or is that going to be like one of like the movie type things? Uh, it'll be more like the movie where it's okay. its own standalone story, and it was really fun. Um, we did not do a story from the books for this one. Um, it's its own really really cool character i mean that's smart because like if you know you make the wrong choices and we have to kill somebody or i'm just kidding <laughs> well well you actually just touched on something that was like really funny for us because we were like wait we can turn the kids into zombies like we can actually Ooh. do this here because there's opportunities to go back so everybody enjoy um <laughs> we definitely have some threads that we put in that uh i think will will uh inspire some uh hopefully like uh light light anxiety moments of like which choice do i make which choice do i make this seems really fun but i don't know if it's the right thing to do so hopefully we're able to get that through so that's coming um and then also the video game is uh deep in production now and so we're doing uh like we're we're literally playing builds of the game uh as we speak and again by the time this podcast comes out um, or shortly thereafter, uh, there's going to be some really, really cool announcements around like actually getting to see what it looks like. Nice. That's, that's awesome. That's the, that's the main thing that we want to hear is like, there's more content coming. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then outside of last kids. So princesses wear pants that we've been developing for a long while is, uh, is now going as a show. Um, there's a, a few more that, unfortunately, you already hit on a lot of the things we can talk about, like Lego Star Wars and yeah. Jurassic World and- um, Good old uh, Wikipedia. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but uh, uh, Princesses Wear Pants is on the way. And then we also have a follow-up project with Max um, based on his Eerie Elementary book series um, that we're also making as a show. 
um, and we've partnered with a very large broadcaster, which we're going to be announcing pretty soon. Um, and that's been a thrill. I'd say, you know, we've loved working with Max. He's been an incredible creative. We think he's a wonderful storyteller. And um, in this, uh, in this one, we are really pushing the horror. Um, we really are, are all kind of horror genre fans. And we really feel like, you know, when you look at the horror space for kids, um, so much of it ages uh, older or is like um, horror leading to teens or sometimes it goes uh, quite soft. And what we wanted was to kind of be like, you know, you have nine and 10 year olds watching Stranger Things nowadays and like, mm -hmm. man, that show's awesome. Um, and so we were thinking like, what would be the show that you would watch before you watch Stranger Things to like get you really excited about this space. And that's really what uh, Erie Elementary is is turning into and, and has become. And um, for us, I think we're really excited. Like Last Kids was all about like, it's the apocalypse, but it's fun. And there's a lot of blue skies. And um, here we are definitely pushing you really far down like the horror road and like playing with like uh, uh, different levels of light and like really wanting to um, uh, go down that space. So it's been a really fun project to work on and uh, we're thrilled to be working with Max again. Nice. Cause, I mean, yeah, speaking of like blue skies, like, I don't think it's rained once in Last Kids so far. So just it's saying, coming. maybe some it's rain gonna elements. It's coming. They need a wash somehow. <laughs> um, yeah, that dude, this has been, this has been so much fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, now, uh, where can everybody find uh, find you all social media wise? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we've got our Atomic Cartoons handles um, uh, pretty much on every social media platform. Um, but then also uh, we've got Last Kids on Earth handles and uh, yeah, our website. Um, you know, feel free to to reach out. Um, you know, we're always just uh, excited to to hear from fans. So we also have like email addresses. We read all emails that come into the studio. Um, so uh, don't hesitate. I can attest to that. They do. <laughs> they do. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, uh, you know, reach out any which way. Nice. Uh, and yeah, like uh, we'll, we'll put everything in the show notes. So if you want to follow Atomic Comics and Last Kids, um, just go to the show notes. Everything will be there. Uh, next week, we've got a special guest. We have uh, Nick Wolfhard, who is the uh, the older brother to some other guy from some other thing. Um, I think you mentioned it earlier. I don't know what it's called. Stranger somethings. Um, but no, who voices uh, Jack in uh, Last Kids on Earth. Totally forgot what the name of the show was. Uh, <laughs> we're also uh, going to be giving away a copy of The Last Kids on Earth. Um, number one, just because I was contemplating. I was like, should we do the new one that comes out in September? But then I was like, well, that would be weird if we gave you like book six and like you've never read them before. So we're going to give you book one um, and it's going to be really easy. Um, all you have to do is follow Atomic Comics. Dang it. No, you don't. Don't follow them. They're, they don't exist. Follow Atomic Cartoons uh, on Instagram and Twitter and follow What's Up Fandom on Instagram and Twitter. Um, that's a, uh, and then enter your favorite uh, last kids on earth character there will be a special uh, post uh, for the giveaway um, you'll just enter your favorite character um, from last kids on earth and you'll be entered to win the drawing that's all you got to do no purchase necessary i'll even ship it outside of the united states that's, that? that's saying something that's expensive like <laughs> matt knows like how much is it to send something up to canada it's all about getting through customs. Yeah. We've had a laptop or two get held up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, oof. Um, I did have another question that I was going to ask, but uh, you're, not, you're not in Canada, so it would have made zero sense to ask it. Um, I was going to ask, why are they called the Toronto Maple Leafs when, like, the plural of leaf is leaves? It makes no sense to me. That's a good question. We can we can find out and get back to you though. Perfect. Thank you. I mean, like I would expect more from our neighbors to the to the Great White North. You know, something like yeah, leaves. But no, we're leafless. <laughs> um, but Matt, again, thank you so much for coming on, man. Oh, absolutely. It was a it was a pleasure to chat. I really appreciate your taking the time, and uh, awesome to get to know you. Oh, you as well. All right. So for what's up, fandom? I'm Josh. Oh. And I'm Matt from Atomic uh, Cartoons. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Take care.
中了。